I don't normally do restoration videos, um, and I've got a Stanley Bailey number four, which was given to me by um, an old lady, and uh, I'm gonna do this up today. So on closer inspection, um, I have looked up the provenance of this plane, and you can see that uh, this doesn't have a plane cap iron, which is in recent years been referred to as a chip breaker. Uh, the blade, I'm pretty sure is a replacement. And as we look at this, you can see a raised uh, lip around the front where the, the front knob is, but there isn't one around the back. So I can tell you that this is a Type 15 that dates between 1931 and 1932. And that provenance is uh, backed up by the fact that the, the, the base of it is colored black and there isn't a raised rib on the back of it. The condition of the underneath of it means that it's been sitting. Um, I know because I picked it up from a, a, a neighbour that was kind enough to give it to me. It belonged to her husband and it was in a damp um, cellar. So as I start pulling this to pieces, um, clearly some of the parts have been uh, renewed or changed, but it's, it's done well. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, you could nail this down to, as I say, 1931 to 1932. So this is a, a very old plane and um, I'm very lucky and privileged to have it. You can see me uh, using the actual uh, blade here to just scrape off the worst of the rubbish so I can get a good look at uh, what we're left with. Okay, so that's everything taken to pieces and having scraped this uh, using the blade, um, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look as bad as I thought it was originally. There's probably more corrosion on the side, and actually it's, it's quite deeply pitted there. And normally I would attack that with um, one of these wire brushes. But recently I bought this product here. And this says that if this is reduced to uh, one part of this to nine parts of water, it removes this rust. So uh, we're going to drop basically all of these components in, all the metal components, this as well and we'll see how this reacts. Technology in rust removal has come a long way in recent days, but uh, I don't think we have in the UK the, the same kind of products that uh, seem to be available in North America. And so um, I'm giving this a trial and uh, it worked, but it didn't work as well as the North American products seem to work. This is the, um, the handle. Uh, the rear handle is also referred to as the tote and the front one is the knob or just the front handle. And I'm guessing that these are probably made out of English oak. And Stanley, uh, who produced these, uh, Stanley Sheffield in the UK, uh, would have made these originally out of white oak. Um, from the 1960s, they were replaced by plastic and it was said that uh, the plastic could withstand much lower temperatures. And I think that was really specifically for North America, because in the UK we don't get those negative temperatures. When I was uh, cleaning up the, uh, the handle and the, uh, the front knob, I was using a, a product called Micra, and the actual sandpaper I was using called uh, Abronet, which is dust-free and comes in a variety of um, grades. I had a real issue trying to remove any of the the stain that had uh, ingressed into the, the deeper parts of the grain. So on the sides it looked okay, but at the front and the back, where basically you're dealing with end grain, it was, um, it was very difficult to get it off. That was 24 hours, uh, and it, it was okay, but I decided to leave it another 24 hours, so it had two days in total. And uh, once it came out, you can see here, that the parts are now rinsed in water so you get a little bit of extra rust that goes on it from just cleaning it in water but it gives you a chance to look at it and you can look at the body of the plane and then when you there look at the uh, the sole of the plane the condition isn't too bad on the sides the pitting was deeper than uh, and probably worse actually than it was on the base and it was about this time when I formulated the idea that I was going to be using um, a diamond uh, sharpening plate to actually clean it up. This has got to be a replacement, there's no way that's an original and um, it still has evidence of uh, lacquer on it which uh, I will uh, remove at a later date. 
the lever cap um, in very very good condition and um, you could just see the telltale signs of uh, the beginnings of, of uh, rust nibs but uh, thankfully I've caught it in time and I have an idea to um, repaint the, the red around Stanley. The frog is in reasonable condition and I think that they call this a frog because if you look at the if you look at the sole of the, the hand plane you have the mouth which is where the blade sticks out and I think the expression a frog in your throat I'm not sure which expression came first but that explains why they call that. Rear handle or tote as it's referred to in recent days. Um, being old I really want to um, restore this I don't want to replace it just because of its age because uh, by definition it's uh, it's 90 years old and then front handle uh, that doesn't have any cracks in it but um, it's a bit dirty and then these are the um, they're actually just called nuts now, I looked up all the name to all the parts and what I intend to do is um, use these uh, rods and nuts to actually attach this to a pedal drill and to um, a hand drill as well in order to mechanically sand that knob and it's uh, it's a surprise to me that they're in as good condition as they are and it, it makes me wonder if those particular parts have been replaced. The difficulty whenever you're sanding is to try and stop the knob from slipping and as you're applying pressure with the sandpaper the knob can sometimes almost come to a halt and so although this was uh, a, an easy way to do it, it it wasn't that effective and I every time I put some real pressure on it it would slip and so I was desperately trying to put these little washers inside it to keep it centralized to stop it from slipping and it worked it worked reasonably well but uh, for those people that don't have access to a pillar drill or you know want to do something up um, without using machines uh, if you've just got a, a hand tool power drill you can do it and I'm just about to show you the method and technique that I used. So I came up with this idea is that this shank when it fits into here this wobbles around so I could use this as a spacer because I'm not going to I'm not going to end up touching this but in order to make it tight what I thought would be a good idea is if I put this in a pair of mole grips like this and I slacken this off quite considerably like that like that and then I put this in using it as a spacer and put that back in there like that turn that round and I tighten this up that's what I wanted now that's completely tight which means that as I rotate this let's just bring the old light down as I rotate this I'll have no movement this won't spin which means that I can apply some serious pressure on that and hopefully should be able to get the sort of um, the sort of uh, effect that I want, so let's have a look. And I decided that this is by far the best and simplest method to uh, sand it down. Your hand does get hot, so I would recommend using a glove or some kind of oven mitt. And I'm also taking this opportunity to use this as a chance to shape the brass nut on top of it as well. That's not perfect, and actually one side of it has got a bit more stain than the other, but I think it's about as good as I'm going to get uh, without really, really, really radically changing the shape of it. So we'll call that done. So we've now got, uh, we've now got the furniture for it. Uh, that's been polished up. So the next thing to do really is to work on this and try and get some try and get a nice shine out of that. Now it's quite an intricate shape so I'm not quite sure what I'm going to use to get that shiny but uh, we'll dream of something and then we've got the hard stuff to do which is putting a shine on that. 
So by using a wedge of wood with some uh, cloth wrap around it and uh, you know liberally soaked in brass polish, I could get a fantastic finish. And I think this is a very rewarding and satisfying um, procedure, cleaning up brass. Oh, who doesn't like that? And I was surprised that the, the same brass polish actually worked extremely well on the lever cap and brought it to a, a very high chrome finish. So that was, uh, that was another plus as well. Still the remnants of a bit of a scratching there. But the idea being is, is that this one is slightly domed, so it fits perfectly into there. And before I put some kind of finish on there, that should look good. This is an indication of how much this has been worn down. By virtue, you can see how much this is sticking out. If I put my hand behind it, you can see how much that's sticking out. I'm gonna leave that, because realistically, when the hand is placed on here, you don't put your hand on the top of it, so I don't mind that, but uh, yeah, just goes to show how much I've actually removed off this. So, so that's come up beautifully. That's the adjuster knob, that looks good. I think it would look nice if we fill this in with red paint. We want to get the bottom of this smooth and flat and shiny. And this is a diamond stone that would usually uh, be used for plain blades and for chisel blades. And it would be used for uh, putting the initial uh, bevel on it before you put the secondary bevel on. If I flip this thing over, I have a more abrasive 400 grit on this side. And my idea is to work this around on this flat surface. And the idea being is, is that, you know, a good polish comes from a flat surface. And um, if I put some lucrum on it here, and we put this on time-lapse, so you should get the opportunity to see a real increase in uh, flatness of the surface and consequently shine. Looking to reduce the pitting on the outside. And so we're just left with a nice, clean, uh, machined look flat surface because it's done on effectively a miniature surface plate which has 400 uh, grit uh, diamond on it it should be absolutely machine flat as well which would be absolutely ideal and so the process begins and i'm using um, a paste um, by trend i think it's called diamond abrasive lapping paste and it's a very uh, creamy liquid it's expensive and here you can see i'm i'm pointing out the little low spots that are remaining and effectively you have to remove all of the shiny material in order to get to the pitted material and so this is a, an exhausting and laborious process that really relies on just continued um, elbow grease to uh, to get the desired result um, but it's worth it and uh, you know it works out in the end. I became truly exhausted doing the side which it's looking okay and so I thought I would treat myself to the base of this so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rub this around nice and smoothly and then when I lift it off you'll be able to see all the high spots. It's only when you first do this process that you can actually find out how out of true the bottom of the sole is. So now when I pull this off oh yeah and sure enough, you can really see where you've got high spots. So looking at that, you can you can see exactly where the plane was touching. It's touching there and it's touching there and it's not touching in the middle. So, you know, what can you expect? Uh, I'm not going to get a good surface out of it. And realistically, the sort of the Lee Nielsen's planes, you know, they're absolutely machine flat on the bottom. So by the time this has been completed and that's been levelled, uh, this is going to produce a much better finish than it would have ever produced when it was um, when it was at the factory because they would never have taken the time and the, and the effort to have flattened the bottom of it and you can just see how far that is out I mean that really is and uh, what we want to do is we want to see that that finish everywhere so yeah it would be wonderful if the deepest of the pitting was on the high spots but you can uh, you can dream can't you so this process, I would say, has been edited down from about two and a half hours. It's 
So as you can see here, I've got this tiny little area here left, and I've got a little bit of this edge here, and I've just got on the very front of the, the, uh, the toe there, and there's just that little bit on the heel there. But what it means is I've got to wear away all the stuff that's beautifully shiny. I've got to wear that away in order to get rid of that, that, and most of that, and this little section that I've got down here. So by this stage I'm pretty tired, so I've decided to put the handles on and, uh, and clean myself up because uh, it's a very messy process. And then I'm going to continue by hand shortly, but I'm just sort of taking a break really. Uh, I found that by putting the handles on at this stage it just meant that I was kind of like using different muscles because I think my hands had almost cramped up from pushing on the, on the body of the frame. And um, I now move on to a little bit of uh, staining and waxing on the, uh, the handle and the knob. And I can see that there is a little bit of stubborn stain that's still stuck in the end grain, but I'm never going to get rid of that. So um, I compare it to this. And if you actually look at the back and the front knob on that, the front's very shiny and the back's a bit more matty. So that's obviously an indication of how the grain truly affects the, the shine. So with that in mind, I get some of this stuff out. And this has a little bit of a tint to it. And so I put that on and then I finish it off with this micro, uh, micro stain wax and that, or micro cilia wax it's called, and that actually provides protection and shine. And uh, it doesn't come out particularly shiny, but I think like most hand tools, the more you use them, the more your the warmth of your hand and the softness of your skin rubs against it, you know, ultimately the better the shine will get, probably in the same way that the, the butt of a rifle would. So there's definitely a bit of a shine to that. It does look very, very pretty. Using that stuff first and that stuff last. And I noticed that actually when I was trying to get the best shine I possibly could, um, the best uh, the best finish I got out of it was by actually rubbing it with a paper towel at the end of it. That's not as shiny that one. Yeah, good enough. So this is what happens after I would say probably six hours and that's six hours at 400 grit. It's not perfect, uh, it's still got some bits on the edges. There is the slightest, it's, it's almost impossible to see, but I know it's there. There is the slightest low spot there where you can just see almost the suggestion of a bit of um, uh, corrosion that it still needs to be rubbed out. But I have to remove everything to get rid of that spot there. And I've been doing it and doing it and it's, it's killing me. So now that I've got this, which looks pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the stone over and I'm going to go to uh, 1000 grit. Um, with this now set to 1000, what I want to do is to polish out all of the 400 grit scratches that we put in them and replace them with 1000. This is, this starts to become fun now. I mean, this is taken up until this stage I don't know, four, five, six hours. I would say probably nearer to six. And you know, it's just, it's back breaking and my arms are actually painful from going backwards and forwards. But now, because we have a totally flat surface, I can feel this is already sort of like feeling draggy from suction. And I'm just gonna get for a perfect finish. So let's see what happens after I've just given this a few seconds. So this is after uh, we've gone through uh, to a thousand grit now on the stone and actually all evidence of any kind of low spot there has gone completely. We're still left with um, this little bit around the front here and on the sides um, just a touch at the front and again a touch at the front there. But that now is, that is absolutely beautiful and flat and uh, I look through the camera here so I can Make sure I've got the proper shine on it. You've got a really super flat surface, and that should give a great uh, that should give a great effect. 
So thankfully we are at the end of that arduous process, um, but it's been very rewarding and I'm very happy with the results. Um, I'm now covering it in machine wax to number one, really get the worst of the black residue off from the, uh, the flattening process. And number two, I want to protect it from any kind of potential rust from fingerprints. And off camera, I've also uh, taken off the sharp corners uh, because they were extremely sharp. I tend to use that product on uh, the router table for the, uh, the bed of the drill, anything like that. Anything where you've got exposed cast iron, milled steel. So that really is now absolutely completely smooth. Remember we took off those sharp edges. That is lovely. You can even see a bit of a reflection there of the camera stand in there. That's good, isn't it? It's lovely. So the handles go on for the last time which gives me an opportunity to inspect the work and uh, I'm really pleased with what I see. Sides and the sole look good and this means that that plane's going to produce a, a very very smooth finish with uh, a sole being that flat. It's um, you know you wouldn't expect to get that flatness of sole unless you were buying a much more expensive plane you know the Lee Nielsen's. I didn't want to paint the inside of it, and the reason I didn't want to paint the inside of it is I kind of didn't want to obliterate its um, its originality. Um, with the handles just being sanded back and waxed, yeah, you know, you can see what it is. But I'll take a black um, marker pen, paint pen, and I'll paint away any chips on the outside. And I also ordered a gold highlighting pen so that I could highlight the uh, Made in England. I cleaned up the uh, blade uh, on this uh, this wire wheel to take off any rust and uh, did the same thing with the frog and the results were, were pleasing. I put a little bit of oil on there as well um, before fitting it and uh, borrowed a chip breaker from another plane. Now the blade itself, the back of it actually is quite uh, corroded towards the tip so that required flattening in preparation for sharpening. But other than that, that blade's uh, in relatively good condition. So now I am flattening the back of the blade on the thousand grit side in order to get a clean face because it's corroded and pitted and you can see there. I'm just trying to get uh, a nice even flat blade and I do. And then I put it into this lovely uh, Lee Nielsen jig, setting it to 25 degrees, which is going to get my primary bevel and uh, as I'm working away on that one um, the previous person that had sharpened it or the last person that had sharpened it had sharpened it in such a way that the blade wasn't uh, it wasn't square so I have to work to make it square and that uh, that process is uh, relatively quick and then once that's been done I can then readjust the jig and set it to 30 degrees and I can put the secondary bevel on there and I don't really want to make this too big because um, I'm just going to give myself more work and then after that I'm going to head off to the uh, the Shapton stone to put the final cutting edge on it and then deburr it. This stone is a Japanese uh, stone that's 16,000 grit so what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint water on there and I know this is flat because I have taken a thousand grit stone over here and I have rubbed the thousand grit stone onto here in order to assure myself that this is actually completely flat. Now you don't need a lot of water on these stones. And with this at the same setting as it was before, so this is now 25 degrees, I'm going to place it up here and with very even pressure I'm going to drag it back and then we're getting a nice line pretty much full width so that's one seven let's see how we've done here and what 
we're looking to do is to turn this edge into an absolute chrome finish and it needs a little bit more so I'm just going to put some more water on there So now when I, I look at the edge myself, you should just be able to see that almost like the, it's about a millimetre wide and it's like a chrome strip. I'm just going to give that a little, I'm just going to give that another go as well. Seven. That, I can see, has got the most powerful of glints. You're just picking it up there. Now, while that, while that's set up, if I now drag this back on here, too. So I've been very careful to only go backwards. Let's just hit this with a bit of wax that you put in here. It helps to polish. So I realise I've still got a burr. But I know that if I if I leave this set up with this, this wheel, I'm gonna get a perfect, you know, I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be putting a camber on the blade because it's a it's about a millimetre wide. Only dragging with great pressure towards me. Only dragging with great pressure towards me. So we're just looking at that tiny little polished edge. Not the, not the primary bevel, but the little tiny secondary bevel, which is like a strip of chrome. It's just got it glinted there. So now that that's done, we can dispense with the, uh, the jig. As it comes. And now what we're left with is a very, very, is this bevel on the back of it, this dirty edge that we want to get rid of. So laying that flat, I'm going to drag that backwards like that. And I'll tell you what, I, I'll take my glove off for this. I can't feel it, but that's not. Uh, Doing the trick at the moment. Uh, if you can see that the hairs just just fall away. See all the hairs on there. Oh, it's just a great big ball patch now. smoother. You couldn't get that smoother with sandpaper. So with the practicalities taken care of it's now time to move on to the aesthetic stuff, the pretty stuff. And I'd ordered a touch-up pen and uh, I was applying this red paint as you can see with a cocktail stick. The uh, contrast against the chrome was stunning and the highlight was putting on this gold paint the contrast was beautiful. I actually ended up with a black highlighting pen which I touched the edges up but I don't think you see that one. And there's the finished product. What a beautiful plane. 90 years old, works perfectly, 
I've been using this for a year now and uh, you'll see this in a number of the projects that I've done. So thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe and uh, I look forward to catching you in the next video. Thanks for watching.